Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another ASUS PC DIY Hardware live stream. Uh, hopefully everybody's having a good Friday, wrapping up things on a positive and productive footing. Um, I'm doing a little bit under the weather, but I'm going to hopefully make it through all right in terms of uh, catching the stream. Uh, excuse me, in terms of uh, hopefully making this a pretty easy stream for you guys. We've actually got some pretty cool, exciting items to be able to go ahead and touch on uh, for today. So let me go ahead and actually show you guys what we got new for this week. Uh, we got some cool things that we're going to be touching on for this week with actually a couple of different updates across different product lines. So we're going to have uh, a new GPU in terms of the entry level side with the dual Radeon RX 5600, a refresh update. A new addition to our ultra wide series uh, with a ProArt PA34, uh, pretty cool monitor. Uh, in addition to that, actually a really cool, exciting update that I know some of you guys in the community might actually be a big fan of, which is the new Hyper M.2 um, adding card, but for PCI Express Gen 5. So our PCI Express Gen 4 actually had two different versions. I know it's actually pretty popular amongst a lot of you out there that actually were looking to stack in a lot of M.2 SSDs. So we've actually got that guy. We've got an update for our mini PC with the mini PC PB63, which will be the system version. Uh, another Zen screen series monitor where we have the MB16 AH fee. Uh, we're actually also going to be following up on the prior announcement that I had with the prior PA series monitor as we actually have the price point for that guy. So I'll be filling in the gaps for that. And I will be giving you guys uh, the confirmation for pricing for essentially our refresh uh, for our initial set of boards. But uh, we're going to actually have a lot more for Z790 because I'm actually going to be talking about our confirmed live stream. So make sure to keep it tuned shortly. I will be talking about actually the confirmed live stream dates that we'll have for all of our launch refresh series Z790 series motherboards. So we're going to have uh, all of that covered as well as your guys' questions and comments. So we'll go ahead and jump into that. Let's see you today. We have joining us on the stream. We've got Bob. Hey, Bob. Love the picture of the dog there. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. We've got Tech joining us as well. We've got Michael. Fantastic. Always having you joining us here on the stream. We've got the one, the only Sue Min. Man, thanks so much for joining us today. Hopefully you're doing good. Uh, we've got Michael, man. Thanks so much for, for joining us here on the stream. Uh, Erica, fantastic. Always having you great here on the stream. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, <laughs> Michael, let me know the chair for JJ. Yeah, I'm hoping that I'm going to get that chair pretty soon. I think I got to reach out to my team and we'll see what happens. Uh, we've got two else we've got here. We've got HiCham joining us as well, man. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. Uh, and we also have uh, another Michael joining us as well. So Michael Braun, man, fantastic, man. Thanks for joining us on uh, today's stream. So let's get ready to go ahead and jump into it. Uh, we've got some good updates to be able to jump into first and foremost. So give me one second here. And uh, first things first, it's just going to be some UEFI BIOS announcements. Um, so no critical, uh, I'd say UEFI BIOS announcements. This is going to be more relating to those of you that might have essentially socket 1700 series motherboards. So maybe you're running uh, Z, original Z6, excuse me, Z690 based motherboards, or maybe you're running one of the other socket 1700 series like B660 uh, or an H series motherboard. So we've continued to go ahead and release UEFI's for those series of motherboards, but a whole new wave just went out today. And it's important to keep in mind that if you do update the corresponding UEFI uh, to support Intel next year series Intel next generation CPUs on those motherboards, that you also want to make sure to update the Intel MEI firmware. So um, I'm going to quickly show you guys an example of this. So give me a go ahead and uh, load up a board here. So I'm going to go ahead and use the RG Strix Z690-E, uh, and we'll use this as a reference here. And we'll have, uh, I'll share the information with our community manager, Jake, and he'll have a post up in the PC DIY group if anybody wants to essentially see the list of all the motherboards that have received the UEFI update. Um, but we also do have a, a landing page, a website that contains essentially links to all the corresponding UEFIs. But for the most part, pretty much all SecCut 1700 boards will receive this update. So they either have already received it or within 24 hours, um, the current refresh set of updates that have just been issued, which is about 40 or 50 motherboards, um, will be up generally uh, within, I'd say, about the next 24 hours. Okay, so if you head over to, of course, the support side, drivers and tools, you go to BIOS and firmware, and you'll see that there's actually a newer release. Now, this one, it hasn't actually updated to the latest version release. There's actually a brand new 2800 series release, which will be the latest build. But it's important to keep in mind that you don't want to just update this UEFI. You do also want to update the MEI firmware. So if you scroll down a bit, uh, you'll see, of course, all the corresponding UEFIs, but then you'll actually see a separate set of downloads specifically for the Intel Management Engine. It's very important that you make sure to align the Intel Management Engine firmware with the corresponding UEFI release, okay? And it will generally note to you that information says, hey, please make sure to also update the corresponding MEI version in relation to that updated BIOS. If you fail to update the MEI firmware, 
uh, and also potentially the MEI driver, your actually system can have a large amount of instability or other problems. So, so I've actually seen people do this where they've updated the UFI BIOS, but they have not actually updated the MEI firmware. So do keep in mind, again, if you are going to make this update, it is important to make sure that you're keeping the updates in alignment. So that update for that UEFI BIOS, and then also make sure that you're doing that update for the MEI firmware. Okay, so that's going to be pretty straightforward, and that pretty much is going to cover all of the updates respective to UEFI BIOS releases. Um, let me go ahead and quickly see if we have any quick questions that might have popped up on that side. Um, doesn't look like it. So, oh, hey, Computech, watching from Trinidad, man, fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy to have you here on the stream, man. Thank you so much. Pretty cool. All right, so that's gonna take care of our UEFI BIOS announcements. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and touch back on um, our giveaway that we have. So uh, this week, we've just got one giveaway to Marin. That's gonna be one that, of course, we announced last week, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and bring it back up again because, of course, it is still active. So uh, give me one second and I will bring this up momentarily. Oh. Give me one second here, guys, and I'll bring up the link here. It should be up here. <laughs> so give me one second and I'll uh, get the link up here. Uh, but this is gonna be for um, a multiple series of products that we actually have available. So this will be, I believe, for um, um, monitor, it'll be for a uh, projector, and I believe uh, router, I think, yeah. So three different items that we have within this giveaway. So let me see, I'm trying to find the corresponding link here. Ah, here we go, okay. Oh, interesting. That link is not active, guys. So I will actually go ahead and check with our team. So uh, let me, one second here, and let me go ahead and confirm with our team on this, so. Okay, so uh, hopefully they'll go ahead and ping me back and let me know uh, if that actually has a revised link. And if it does, I'll go ahead and make sure and share it with you guys. So I believe we are going to be running that promotion all the way until to December. So it is actually going to be running for a period of time. Um, I will show you guys right here just as a quick reference what I'm referring to. So if you guys actually check out our social feeds, we'll also make sure to go ahead and share it in the PCDIY group. But you can see right here, it's Find Your Zen with Asus. So we're actually going to be giving away, you can see right here, one of our latest uh, portable series monitors. Uh, this is a really cool design where it actually has an integration kickstand it has actually dual connections on both the left and the right hand side and the way that it actually aligns with your uh, let's say laptop if you were to put it next to your laptop it's pretty cool is that uh, you can actually adjust that angle to be in alignment kind of within the same actually angle that you have your primary display so pretty slick and again because you have the connections on both the left and right hand side you don't have any obstructions in terms of having like a cable be spaced between you having the laptop display and then of course the portable display so you can actually have them be in perfect alignment next to each other so that's pretty cool this is our latest uh, portable projector this is actually the l2 it's a full 1080p based projector really cool has actually an integrated uh, support for actually a streaming box in there, HDMI connectivity, other things like that. So pretty nice. And then of course we have one of our latest Zen Wi-Fi series solutions as well. Uh, looks like actually our team uh, might be telling me that we have the link, not yet. So uh, I'll go ahead and follow up on that guys. But uh, let me see if there's any other quick questions that might've came up on that side. Um... So yeah, Guts TV is going, as I saw that the Z790 Apex got a BIOS update Intel microcode um, a few months ago. Yeah, so essentially, any board that's on their socket 1700 will receive essentially updated UEFI support to the latest degree for essentially the latest 14 series. So we started already previously uh, all the way back, I think in late July, started issuing essentially interoperability builds. So interoperability builds will mean least that the system can uh, post. It may not be perfectly tuned for best performance, but you actually will be able to install the CPU and essentially have it post. Um, we do always recommend though, that essentially you check the corresponding UEFI release. And if there's a newer build, you wanna make sure to go ahead and update to that latest build so that you get the best performance, best stability, the best overall interoperability and compatibility. So um, yeah, just double check that. And actually some people are not aware, but it's actually pretty cool. If you get your motherboard, you can actually check the corresponding serial number. So if you buy a new motherboard, and you're unsure if essentially the motherboard, what version it has, although this is less of an issue if the motherboard has USB BIOS flashback because you can update the UEFI BIOS without the CPU or the memory of the graphics card, right? Um, 
you can actually check the serial number and actually the end of the serial number, the batch production information will actually list to you the corresponding UEFI build. So you can actually see like it says like 1402, but then you can actually see that the latest build on the website is like 2800. So you actually have the ability to know what was shipped on the motherboard without actually even powering on posting the system. Um, I actually have a dedicated video on this specific topic on our PCDIY YouTube channel. So you can check that out if you're looking for a little bit more information in that regard. Okay. Um, Shadow goes, uh, any release on the ROG Azoth in white? Uh, no specific details yet. Uh, it'll be coming in the not too distant future. Um, I did already kind of tease that model. We are going to be launching that in Q4 timeframe, so it is going to be coming. I'm very excited about that addition. It's a great option. Uh, one of the cool things also, I believe that the white model will be coming with a refresh version of our ROG uh, Storm Switches, which ROG Storm Switches are even uh, a, a more premium offering that we offered with our binned and lubed um, ROG NX basis switches. And so for some of you might be wondering, like, what are you talking about, JJ? Um, I can show you right here. So let me see here. I think I should have it under this folder. Uh, yeah. So this is going to be essentially, if you're not aware, we already have a very premium, essentially kind of custom keyboard that allows for a, a lot of flexibility in terms of outside hot swap PCB. But of course, it has multi layers of sound dampening foam. Um, it has actually like a semi gasket mounting design and OLED display. So we will be offering an updated version in terms of a color offering with the Moonlight White edition. So this is going to be the Azoth here in Moonlight White. So this will be coming out a little bit later on. Um, again, as we normally do when we talk about any new product releases, uh, in the product releases, I will note specifically what we are going to be releasing for this week. Beyond that, sometimes people, of course, ask, hey, when are you going to come out with something? And I can only give you a rough barometer because there's a lot of factors as far as when we release something to uh, what's referred to as the channel for broader availability. But uh, our expectation is to release the Azoth, I think, earlier on in Q4. So we just, of course, got into Q4. So in the not too distant future, as always, just make sure to keep it tuned to the PCIY channel here uh, for the weekly streams or the PCDIY group uh, for any updates on any new product announcements. All right. Um, where is the new uh, tech is asking me about a board that uh, you may or may have not seen. Maybe certain uh, leaks maybe come out. Um, as I've noted, right, we can only talk about what we've officially announced. And so make sure to join us on uh, that will be, I guess, my follow up announcement here is that we will have actually our full in-depth live stream. Uh, which will be actually on the 16th. So it will be hosted, of course, by the one, the only me. Um, I will be there and I will give you guys a full breakdown on all of our new Z790 series motherboards. So if you guys actually saw, um, we haven't... Uh we haven't essentially announced all of our new models, but we have given you a little bit of kind of a teaser here. So you might see that there might be some other models here that we may or may have not uh, essentially announced. Um, but you're going to just want to make sure to keep it tuned. On the 16th, we will be unveiling all of the information. We'll give you all the insights. And as always, if you're looking for any kind of the features, functions, spe uh, specification differences, all that stuff, I will be tackling all of that in that live stream. We'll also have follow-up independent videos that I have uh, for each respective series. So I'll have uh, kind of breakdowns specific to ROG Maximus, ROG Strix and Tough Gaming Models, which are going to be our refresh series for Z790. And then we'll also be following it up um, with an overclocking live stream. So I'll have a dedicated overclocking live stream that will focus in on Intel next generation overclocking performance. We'll do some DDR5 overclocking. We'll jump into the latest demonstration of Asus AIOC, uh, take a look at some really cool new exciting features that we have for DDR5 overclocking support. So all of that will be forthcoming. Um, and if you guys are following us in the PCDIY group or you're subscribed to the PCDIY YouTube channel, or excuse me, the Asus North America YouTube channel, you'll see the notification pop up when we make the reservations for that in the not too distant future. So make sure to keep it tuned there if you want to find out about all the latest and greatest when it comes to our next gen z790 based motherboards all right guys um let me go ahead and quickly see any quick updates right there um uh, AI White is asking is, will the Intel 14th gen CPUs run on Z690? So yes, uh, I, actually I just talked about that, right? So all essentially socket 1700 series motherboards. So, you know, current B760, B660, uh, Z690, all of those more motherboards already support Intel next gen series CPUs. You just need to make sure to update the UEFI uh, BIOS and you also need to update that management engine firmware. So if you guys saw, I just talked about that a little bit earlier, just make sure to go to the corresponding support site for your model, download the UEFI and also make sure to download that corresponding MEI firmware, and you are going to be good to go. All right. 
Um, somebody's asking right here, is that a new Asus microphone you're using? Just notice the Strix Magnus is missing. Ah, that's a good thing. No, I've actually had this one for a little while um, that I've been here. It's actually not our new one, but I can tell you, I've talked about that we do have actually under design and development our next generation ROG microphone. I actually just got the chance to actually get an early look at the finalized design and some of our finalized features and functions, and I'm very excited about it. And so, as always, guys, just make sure to keep it tuned and you'll find out about all the latest and greatest coming from Asus and from ROG. Um, but definitely that's still a bit of while off, but we do have something in the pipeline in terms of design and development for a refresh to our ROG Magnus. So that was our prior essentially high quality performing uh, condenser microphone. So make sure to keep it tuned if you're going to be interested in that. All right. Um, Facebook user notes is that um, motherboards seem to be pretty expensive. Um, you know, you have to consider there's a lot of factors when you talk about the design and development motherboard. Uh, some people kind of want to make a um, an Apple and the Apple comparison, and they want to look at like one board from one generation and compare the pricing to another. But it's very important to understand that actually as we've uh, kind of progressed in terms of board design, uh, especially over the last few years, and this is independent of uh, um, independent market conditions, such as let's say the cost of let's say copper or silicon or raw materials or production or shipping, which have actually seen uh, cost increases. If you talk actually about the base design of a motherboard, it's actually become inherently more complex. A good example of this is if you just uh, evaluate something like the PCB layer count. So uh, let me go ahead and see if I can grab this uh, for reference. <clears throat> so this is going to be a pretty high-end board, but it won't matter. I'm just using this for a visual reference. Um, so when you talk about a motherboard, you're generally actually talking about this part right here, which will be the PCB. So this is going to be the PCB on the motherboard. Um, for a long time, actually, I'll good amount of motherboards within the, let's say the entry to even sometimes the mid-range space were generally only about a four layer PCB motherboard. Sometimes they might have been a six layer PCB, um, but now commonly you'll find actually find that even amongst many of the entry to the, the mid-range motherboards, we've gone to at least six layer or eight layer PCBs. On top of that, when we uh, transitioned into the PCI Gen 4 era, and of course now we have PCI Gen 5, the stringence um, at the signal integrity is significantly more challenging than what you had with prior generations of PCI Express. Now, why does that matter? Because then that means that there's going to be actually more advanced PCB production requirements that are going to be applied to the motherboard. Um, you might actually introduce new types of PCB uh, designs that are called actually mid-loss or low-loss PCBs. So these things weren't previously utilized or they might have been used for maybe specialized very high-end product like maybe like in server or workstation or maybe like mini ITX based boards or maybe some of our enthusiast based motherboards. But now you're even seeing this come down within the entry. You then start to add in then also things like because of high core count CPUs, the socket has become much hotter than it used to be. So we have to actually to be able to provide better thermal dissipation. A lot of boards now commonly will have two ounces of copper that are present within there. And again, a lot of times in the past, you used to see in the mid range and the entry only one ounce of copper uh, within that. So just the pure production cost has gone up considerably because your material cost has gone up. You then add in many other factors as far as, you know, power delivery components, which have seen upgrades, IO specifications where now every motherboard is seeing Wi-Fi, where before you had even motherboards that didn't even have Wi-Fi. That doesn't come at no cost. Users want it, but if you add it in, it's going to add a cost in there. Um, the value proposition, though, I think is quite strong. So I do think that from my perspective, if you take a look at even within the entry segment, boards that are at, you know, $180 to $250 um, have a very, very strong value proposition that you get much more features than you ever have. So I would say actually the value proposition is better than it's ever been. But yes, you have seen pricing go up, but that inversely comes because, like I said, of the design complexity. And there's really no way to escape that. Um, even if you look at kind of the commoditization of certain specifications in the market, another good example might be something like if you take a look at Ethernet, right? Um, almost no motherboards, especially within the mid-range or the enthusiast space, come with anything less than a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet controller, right? Now, one gigabit is very common. Uh, if you take a look at independent of the motherboard market, just go to your e-tailer of choice, go search for a five gigabit, giga, excuse me, five port gigabit switch. It's going to probably cost you maybe about 20 to $25. Now go look up the cost for a five port 2.5 gigabit switch. And you'll probably see that the cost delta is maybe four to five X. What that shows you is that even in a commoditized market for just a basic switch, the cost is not parity. And so you then 
see how that can apply to a motherboard, where if we're moving over from a one gigabit specification to a 2.5 gigabit specification, it also increases cost, right? And now you could ask saying, do you want to put 2.5 or do you not want to put 2.5? But that comes then where we see a lot of feedback from the users that say, we want this specification. So, um, you know, overall, that's something that we work very hard on. And, you know, even in the, the motherboards I'm going to touch on today, that's the reason why I think we try to offer great value across different series, whether it's our Prime series, Tough Gaming series, or of course, even in our enthusiast product, like, you know, RG Strix or RG Maximus. But hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight into that. To be honest, it doesn't really get talked about to a, I think to an in-depth degree that it should, as far as offering clarity at what really affects cost. Sometimes people just generalize saying, hey, cost is this. But just with some of those insights, you can actually begin to understand that what you are now getting is quite a bit different than what you used to be getting. Um, so there's really no way to go backwards because to go backwards and to make something that would be significantly lower in cost, you would literally have to start to pull everything out, right? It would mean, again, going back to a four layer board, one ounce of copper, standard gigabit, not having the signal integrity requirements for higher spec PCI gen, right? You know, and, and all those different factors. So hopefully that provides um, some context and some insight into that question for you. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. Um, Kanichi goes, any news on the next Matrix wave? Uh, white Hyperion, I think I already announced the White Hyperion, so that should be coming in in terms of channel availability. Um, I'll ping our team and see if I can have Jake provide an update within the community, but um, you should be probably seeing that, that Hyperion pop up pretty much, I think, any day now. Um, you know, Hopefully, I think the first listing will be within the Asus eStore, probably followed up by Newegg, but I would expect probably next week in terms of the listing for the Hyperion. Um, so just make sure to watch out for that. As far as for the Matrix, the Matrix is slotted, I think, probably for next week. We should start to look at probably receiving receiving our next batch refresh. Um, I don't know exactly when next week, it could even be following the following week, but we will try to provide visibility uh, within those that are in our PCDIY group um, because it might not align with the, the stream date, right? Because we do only the streams on Friday. So I would recommend if you want to buy to find out about the matrix, be in the group, watch out for any posts that Jake might make as far as if we can confirm that information from um, our account team, as far as when we actually get inventory and then what we're going to be pushing out in terms of availability. Do keep in mind though, of course, that the matrix is going to be ultra limited. It's a very, very small production allocation. So, um, it is going to be tight. Um, and of course when it's gone, it's gone. All right. Hey, David Mayers. Um, I'm not sure what your specific issues, if you actually have more constructive feedback to actually genuinely provide as far as what your, I guess, consideration is as far as where you feel that there's an issue, um, feel free and actually email me, pcdiy.asus.com. I'd love to actually get a sense of that. Um, you know, software is a complicated topic. There's a lot of things. And to be frank, sometimes it can be actually an issue relating to the user's experience because maybe they don't want to reinstall their operating system and they swap out boards and they keep over older OSs. They might have contentions with other similar applications that are installed. Um, I can tell you though that we really do earnestly work, I think on the software development side to offer an application that's stable and reliable and offers a high degree of functionality. And we also work on firmware level controls for functions that we can have be independent of the software-based environment. Um, and you know, beyond that, it's, it's a little bit hard to give a little bit more specific response without giving you know, more context because your statement is just very general. Um, but, you know, if you have more specific feedback, feel free and let us know. But, um, you know, the reality is that especially for even things like fan controls or Asus AIOC or a lot of those elements, you don't even have to install any software. You can run those all directly from the firmware. It just really depends on what is your kind of core ambition that you want. And I would also note that if we really talk about performance, there's sometimes a perception that people think about like uh, uh, CPU utilization or things like that that's actually very much incorrect. Um, I'll give you a very good example. Um, if you take actually a look at like Signal RGB versus like Armory Crate, Armory Crate CPU utilization is significantly lower than a third party application like Signal RGB, where we actually use something that is called a UWP process, which means it's a suspended application. That means when it's not even in the foreground, it actually doesn't utilize any CPU uh, utilization. It doesn't actively utilize an active memory footprint. So you actually have to launch the program. That was actually something that we implemented after you know additional time and feedback to be able to offer users even a better experience. And there's been a lot of those things that we've released. You know, again, when you kind of posit 
feedback on software, it's important to be specific on what version of software. You know, the community has a lot of opinions when it comes to things like Windows, where some people say, I don't like this version of Windows, and I do like this version of Windows. And it's important to differentiate which version of Windows you're talking about, right? So just like with AC, we've now had that software for years. So is your feedback contingent on something from three years ago where that software doesn't exist anymore because now we're at version you know, 5.x or whatever it might be, right? So um, I look forward to your feedback uh, if you want to supply it. Um, so again, pcdiy at asus.com, okay? All right. Um, let me go ahead and see here if um, there's anything else. I was... <clears throat> hey, MP, man, how you doing, man? Uh, going to do a special project with the Hyperion, man. If it's anything like your last project, I'm sure it's absolutely going to be stunning. So that's going to be pretty sweet. Um, Michael notes, is there any issues in terms of 4090 availability? I believe there is a... Um, I don't know the active last refresh it is. So of course we have quite a number of 4090s. So we have the ROG Strix 4090, we have the Tough Gaming OG 4090, we have the Tough uh, 4090, we have the Matrix. Um, so you'd have to ask specifically more which which GPU you actually, excuse me, which graphics card you actually mean. And then we can attempt to try to find out what the next forecasted shipment is. So if you can be a bit more specific, Michael, uh, feel free again to either post in the PC DIY group and tag Jake, and we can look at what our next forecasted availability for refresh is for that GPU. Um, how much does a good computer for uh, a computer set for live streaming cost? So before I guess we get into our next question, that's a really good question. Um, it's actually really not, very expensive at all. The reality is it really kind of just depends on what you're looking to do. Um, you can actually live stream on a pretty basic system if it's fairly modern. Um, the big benefit now with a lot of modern systems, if it has some form of integrated iGPU, whether it's from Intel or from AMD, or even if you have a basic GPU, um, most streaming applications will support some form of what's called GPU acceleration. That means that they can do the streaming on a special fixed part of the GPU, and that relieves a lot of stress from the CPU. Now, if you decide to use a streaming uh, application that utilizes only the CPU, that can actually be quite a bit more taxing especially if you want a higher bit rate and higher resolution. Um, but if you're happy doing streaming, which can be quite good utilizing the acceleration on the iGPU, you don't actually need a very expensive system. So he says, how much would that cost? Um, you literally could, you could do it on a system that literally costs you $600. That's, you know, it's entirely possible. There's many PCs that actually would be even cheaper than that, where again, you could do this. Um, laptops, again, would also be another option. So it's not very expensive. It really just comes down to what is the extent of what you want to be doing on the system? Are you also going to be gaming simultaneously? Are you just going to be streaming certain uh, content from like a, uh, from a screen, right? You have to account for a lot more questions. Uh, if you're looking maybe for some recommendations, again, I would probably recommend consider posting in our PC DIY group and um, tagging maybe, uh, you know, Jake in our group and see if we can provide you a little bit more feedback or thoughts, okay? All right. Uh, hey, uh, GP Stuntman, happy to have you here. Uh, Harid also joining us right here. Uh, pretty cool. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and go into our next item. So let's jump into it quickly here. So see what we've got. So I noted on the giveaways and uh, product announcements and our upcoming live stream. So let's go quickly go ahead and get into some of our new product releases. So let's go ahead and see what, what do we want to jump into first? Um, the GPU, I don't actually think I need to really refresh this GPU. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. This is just a refresh to solidify this market option. So I'm not going to highlight it too much. So I won't worry about that. But if you are guys are looking for just an entry basic graphics card, um, you know, of course, this is going to be much faster than you had have an integrated iGPU, we are refreshing our current dual RX 5600 uh, that we have available. So just FYI, it's available there. Uh, but of course, we have a wide range of GPUs. If, you know, for probably most of you, probably more maybe in that in, you know, at least moderate enthusiast gaming race space. So maybe something like a Radeon RX 7600 or something like that, right, is probably maybe where you would be starting at. Uh, but again, we refresh that. So what do you guys think? Uh, ProArt Monitor, the Hyper M.2 card, the PB63 or the MB16 AHV. Let's go ahead and see what the quick feedback is, and we will go from there. <laughs> Zoom in goes, is I need my matrix. Uh, yeah, well, like I said, hopefully uh, this week we should be getting our refresh channel availability, so just make sure to go ahead and, and keep it tuned for that, and in, hopefully in the not-too-distant future we should be able to provide a stock availability update to those in the PCDIY group uh, when we do have a refresh in coming in, okay? Um, looks like we got hyper and we got mini PC. So it's, it's even, it's a 50, 50. Somebody has got to break that split. 
All right, uh, MP customizable. He notes the hyper, so we're gonna go ahead and do the hyper first. So let me go ahead and bring that up. So this one is gonna be pretty interesting. This is an update for those of you that are big fans of having lots of M.2 base SSDs. I think some of you will know that actually I'm personally a fan much more of U.2 and U.3 than I am on M.2 because M.2, it's more power constrained, it's more density constrained, it's heat restrained, right? Um, so it's quite a bit more challenging, uh, especially if you want larger densities, right? Some people end up having to stack, you know, two, three, four drives when like in one of my personal systems, you could be running a 20, a 24, a 30 terabyte drive if you want U.2 or U.3 with a single drive that is only using one PCI Express lane where with multiple drives, you gotta use lots of lanes. But for those of you like M.2 and you wanna go that route and you're also interested in the next generation, well, guess what? We've got you covered here. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. This is gonna be the next gen PCIe MVME uh, Hyper M.2 adding card. So this guy's gonna be coming in at $80. We already currently have a PCI Gen 4 version. That one won't be going away. This will just be a follow-up addition to that model. And uh, essentially the big claim to fame here is going to be that this one will give you um, essentially PCI Gen 5 support. Now we have gone ahead and tweaked a couple of things when it comes to the card's design. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of a closer look at it right here. So you'll see that uh, the prior model uh, was actually silver in terms of the actual heatsink design. This will actually be black. Um, I think that means, of course, great goes with so many different things. Black is always a really clean kind of monochrome based design. Now, one of the things that you're actually gonna notice here that's quite interesting is um, this the uh, previous model did not actually have thermal pads um, that were on the card. Now, that's the reason why when it was first designed and developed, you didn't necessarily have as common M.2 SSDs that were called dual stacked in terms of their NAND. That means that they had NAND chips on the front and on the back. But as we see now, larger density M.2 SSDs come to the market. So especially as you start to look at some of the two terabytes, four terabytes, eight terabyte drives, you're probably gonna have NAND on the front and on the back. And then there's also the controller. Um, those can of course all produce their own levels of heat output. And so this actually card design will allow for better thermal dissipation performance from essentially the top and the bottom. So uh, there's actually thermal pads that are on this part in terms of the this top milled heatsink here, and then on the card itself. You'll also see that we obviously have integrated here the M.2Q uh, latch design. So that means it's a really easy way to just be able to lock in the M.2 SSD. You don't have to worry about the standoff and the screws. You can just angle in the M.2 SSD and lock it into place. So very, very simple, very, very easy to use. Um, another update that we went ahead and implemented is you're gonna see this cable right here. So you might be wondering, well, what is this cable all about? Well, one of the cool things that we had from feedback was from users that wanted to have more granularity and control to control the fan. So previously, uh, the thermals were actually tracked by the card and it would essentially automatically adjust the fan curve for the fan. But for users that might be more critically maybe running a specific type of persistent workload or maybe they just want to tune it for their acoustic preference, right? Whether it's a little bit quieter or maybe they want to focus more on thermal performance, whatever it might be, you can make this connection to the card and then connect that to the motherboard. When you connect that to the motherboard, we will intelligently route that to our fan expert software. And so within fan expert, you will actually be able to control the fan for the Hyper M.2 adding card. So that is gonna be another addition. So again, um, this card will be introducing PCI Gen 5 support. It will also include the dual sided contacts for improved thermal dissipation performance. It will also include the Q-latch design. And also something you may not be aware of is that uh, we really have had really great reliability and feedback from users that have utilized our cards compared to a lot of, let's say the maybe no brand solutions that are out there. And part of that is because we have a much higher stringent tolerance for our PCB design. We actually use a server grade low loss PCB design here that allows actually the signal integrity performance to be very good. And that's actually very important for high speed based signaling. Um, this is actually similar to sometimes the demands that you need with very good riser cables. Um, poorer riser cables on the market that maybe don't go through as much EMI testing or signal analysis testing can actually sometimes be subpar in their interoperability and compatibility or sustained performance. So we also um, have a very good track record of having users when they utilize it have a consistently reliable experience as opposed to sometimes maybe drives dropping in and out or kind of weird irregular parameters of things like that that can happen. So that is also something that it's not easily visible there, but it kind of goes into the inherent design of the product, okay? So um, overall, pretty straightforward. You can also see that there is an option there to physically toggle the fan off and on. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward, single slot. Um, now, one thing that you do wanna keep in mind is that with this type of card, it is optimally suited for a motherboard that does support what's called PCIe bifurcation. Uh, the reason why it needs to support PCI bifurcation is the slot essentially needs to be able to send PCI slot signals 
to each one of these M.2 SSD slots, right? So if the motherboard cannot actually send that, it won't be actually able to correctly utilize all the slots. Now, most of our current generation motherboards will generally support PCIe bifurcation. We do actually have an FAQ document on our service and support website that does note the models. Um, there also may be a requirement that you may have to toggle something within the UEFI BIOS to enable this function, but you do want to keep that in mind, okay? So one, your motherboard needs to support PCI bifurcation. And then it also, um, ideally, if you of course want PCI Gen 5 operation, it also needs to have a secondary slot. Now, many motherboards will not have necessarily a secondary PCIe NVMe slot. So let me go ahead and show you as an example here, um, uh, I can give you an example like of a motherboard that would support um, a secondary slot that would be high speed wired. Many of the, especially the mid range series motherboards, at least on the Intel side of the fence, they actually don't have a uh, high speed secondary PCI slot because many uh, systems essentially now, well, it's not many systems, pretty much there is no longer any type of active support for multi GPU. So from a design perspective, us as a motherboard manufacturer have limited implementing that type of spec. But if we took a look at a model here, like the ProArt motherboard, because the ProArt motherboard, we designed it to be able to support dual GPUs because creators can actually benefit from dual GPUs unlike gamers right now, which cannot leverage dual GPU designs. This slot is um, wired all the way up to by 16 and it could support by eight operation. And this slot can also support by eight operation as well. So you can actually put something in there and then you can have that PCI bifurcation. So that's an example of you need to verify on the board and then the spec that it defines. Now, generally, if you move into higher, what are called uh, high-end enthusiast desktop motherboards. So things like TRX40, X299, um, of course, AMD, which has more PCI Express lanes for chipsets like the B650E or the X670E, you will have more liberal PCIe bandwidth uh, to be able to support these type of devices. So hopefully that gives you some context in terms of items that you do want to keep in mind. And uh, I do believe there is an active link already up for this one. So let me go ahead and share that in there and I'll, I'll check, check to see if there's any quick questions on that. Um, so, so uh, Nori goes, is what Asus motherboard can I use with the Hyper M.2? So that's why I was noting is that you would just want to make sure to check the list, uh, the PCI bifurcation list that we'll have. And that is actually noted there where you can bring that up in the spe tech spec information and in the QVL information on the website. But again, the main thing you want to check for is that the motherboard supports PCI bifurcation. And then critically, if you're, if you're not using the primary slot, so if you're going to use some sort of secondary slot, that that secondary slot also has to be wired for PCI Gen 5 specification support, right? Um, MP goes RAID 0 support. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you could you could run RAID 0. I mean, I'm not a big fan of uh, RAID in terms of running it. Um, I prefer usually in this type of situations, so like usually some form of like a JBOD configuration. But if you did want to do it, yes, you can. Um, I know also some users that might be asking, hey, does this actually support Gen 4 operation? Yes. So it is backwards compatible that it can actually support um, Gen 4 operation. Also keep in mind that with some platforms, okay, this is important to note, some platforms, especially on Intel platforms, may make a requirement that the link for the actual enablement of the card has to come through the CPU linked lanes as opposed to the chipset linked lanes. Again, you're going to want to make sure to reference the support documentation for this model, okay? Um, when is this out? Uh, Demani is asking. Um, probably we should have channel availability, I would estimate, probably within the next 7 to 14 days, okay? Hey, Michael, um, if you have an issue, I'd recommend reaching out to our service and support team and, and denoting to them. Again, um, this system right here, I just ran Fan Expert right now on it before I started the stream because I was recalibrating it for a new UEFI update and I was doing some overclocking. Um, it worked fine. And also my personal system and the two other demo systems that I run I recently used it within the last week and I didn't have any issues. But again, um, if you've at least confirmed your issue and you can duplicate it, especially under a new OS environment, so that means that you don't have any pre-existing other things that might be causing you an issue, uh, feel free to reach out to our services support team so we can work on attempting to debug your issue. And of course, the other thing too is that you can always cross-check Fan Expert working from the OS environment to the UEFI firmware environment because we do offer fan controls both in the UEFI BIOS as well as within the operating system, okay? All right, uh, let me go ahead and quickly see any other quick questions right there. All right. 
Perfect. So that takes care of that, guys. I'm going to go ahead and drop this link in there for you if anybody's interested in that. So let me go ahead and drop this one in there. Give me one second. All right, there you guys go. So, oh, yes, I see what you mean. Yes, let me go ahead and, and fix that. <laughs> so, yes, it was hyper. There we go. All right. So, yes, the hyper M.2 PCIe Gen, uh, Gen 5 adding card, right? So, that is going to be, sorry. Yes, I forgot Gen 5 too. Like I said, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, but there we go. We caught it. So, yes, the Hyper M.2 PCI Gen 5 add-in card coming in at essentially $80 and probably look for channel availability, like I said, probably within the next about 7 to 14 days. All right, guys. So that hopefully gets you covered there. So uh, if anybody's interested in updating, and again, remember that if you are interested, um, we do still have, of course, the PCI Express Gen 4 version, if you want that, as opposed to the Gen 5 version. But this one also... Um, supports both Gen, Gen, Gen 4 and Gen 5 operations, so you can do both. All right, all right, guys, so let's go into our next one here. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and let's bang out these monitors quickly, so we're going to go through some of the monitors. All right, so next up, we're going to go first with, uh, let's go with the Zen screen. So yeah, I think we're going to go with the Zen screen. So give me one second here, and I'll bring this up. So this is definitely going to be a lower priced option than what we had with, um, of course, our higher end model that we're going to talk about. But the higher end model, of course, is a higher resolution, has 10 point touch, um, has more input options. Um, keep in mind, again, while I might be only showing you two, right, some of you guys sometimes are surprised when we talk about our portable displays, but we have a really comprehensive portfolio. We're actually the largest vendor right now for portable displays. So we have everything from OLED solutions to fully wireless solutions. We have 13 inch, we have 14 inch, we have 15 inch, we have 16, 17, all the way up to the biggest model, 24 inch, which came out uh, not that long ago. So we have all kinds of variations in terms of resolution, high refresh rate, OLED, LCD, touch, right? All kinds of permutations and across all kinds of different price points. So if you are interested in this and you haven't checked them out, feel free to go ahead and check them out. These are just two new models, right? These are just new models that we're touching on. We're not trying to recap on all the models because we have literally, I think right now, actively maybe close to 30 plus uh, portable displays. Okay. So this is going to be the MB. Uh, give me one second. Uh, this is going to be the MB right here. Yes, uh, MB 16 AH fee. So coming in at $200, 16 inches, so 15.6 inch uh, full HD, so 1080 p 1920 by 1080. This is an IPS based display. It does have a mini HDMI connector on there along with USB type C. Uh, the USB type C will also give you flexibility in terms of just additional connection support. Um, it does feature a special AR Cody as well to be able to handle essentially uh, reflection handling because you might be traveling with it. Maybe you're going to get caught with some overhead lighting, so it helps to reduce that. And then that antibacterial treatment is something that we've been offering in more and more products, which just essentially means that there's a treatment to the polymer, uh, which essentially helps to mitigate the um, essentially the, the growth of any type of bacteria on there. So it's less likely to essentially have bacteria be able to form and maintain itself over time. So especially with something that you might be touching or other people might be touching, that's a cool little just enhancement that we offer now with a, a larger number of our products where we've had the antibacterial treatment on a large number of our displays and we've even introduced it into some of our peripheral product as well. Um, now you'll see quite light in terms of actually 0.9 kilograms, uh, 10.5 millimeters in terms of its overall slim profile. Um, so very easy to go ahead and put into a bag, right? Um, that what that USB-C connectivity does support DP alt mode, but it's very important that you have to remember that your device needs to support DP alt mode. So HDMI is going to be the most flexible because you can use HDMI with anything. You could use HDMI with a camera. You could go ahead and use HDMI with a console. You could use it with a laptop, with a desktop, with whatever you want. But if you use the USB-C, not all USB-C ports inherently support display alt, especially mobile devices. So if you have a phone, your phone, you need to actually check to make sure that it supports DP out output. Okay. So again, if you want to use that USB-C, because there are some people who goes like, I plug this in and it doesn't work. And generally it's pretty much in a situation where their device doesn't support that. So you do want to check the documentation uh, for your device. Okay. Um, now, another cool thing is that you'll see that it does have an integrated essentially kickstand. So that allows you to have some nice multi-axis adjustment for viewing angle, but it does also support we have our quick attachment for our tripod. So this is an independent tripod that we sell. So you can actually mount this 
directly onto the back of the display. So if you wanted to have like a more fixed display, maybe be able to take it on the road, but then be able to come back to your desk and be able to prop it up, you're good to go. And keep in mind that of course, this does also rotate. So if you want to be able to use it in a landscape or horizontal orientation, you have that flexibility. So you can use it in either or orientation. As you see right there, you've got it in a um, vertical orientation versus the traditional horizontal orientation. All right. So uh, I think a nice addition that we have here in terms of our portable display with the MB16AHV. All right. Let me quickly see if we got any quick questions there before we go to the next model. Uh, hey, Marion, um, sorry you had an issue. If you have an issue, feel free to go ahead and reach out to our service and support team. We, you know, we have uh, everything from email to live chat, and they can hopefully attempt to work with you. On this stream, we focus only on our what are called our component products, so not like laptops or other devices like that. But feel free to go ahead and reach out to our service and support team, and hopefully they can assist you in uh, whatever it might be that uh, you have questions or concerns regarding. Okay. All right. Um, let me go ahead and just quickly see if there's any other quick questions. All right, so it uh, looks like we got some love there. I think some thumbs up there on the portable display. Yeah, I think it's a nice addition for sure. All right, let's go here with our next model that we're going to touch on, which is going to be the uh, ProArt PA169CDV. Uh, so this is going to be a much higher end base model. And essentially with this display uh, here, you'll notice that the other model was our Zen screen series. And the Zen screen series can be quite nice, uh, but with our professional series, of course, they're going to offer a much richer level of functionality and also color performances. So generally, they will be Pantone validated. They will be factory calibrated. They will have a wider color gamut coverage. Um, also, for our ProArt series displays, they have also offered more flexible types of options uh, for how you can control the use it, such as like our integrated ASUS dial, multi-point touch. So this is the reason why you see so much of a higher cost is that this is somebody for that might be also more professional. This is also our first model that we're in including with um, Wacom EMR. So Wacom EMR is of course an advanced form of stylus input. So you could be using this alternatively for actually like not only note taking, but actually art, right? If you actually wanted to do that. So we're gonna take a look at this model here. This is the PA169 CDV. So 15.6 inches, this will be IPS, but 4K resolution. The prior model that we talked about was only 1080, uh, but this will be 4K. It also includes with Wacom EMR, 100% sRGB coverage. You'll see the Pantone validation, uh, USB-C as well, and that 10 point touch. Uh, the ASUS dial support is actually the dial that's on here. So the cool thing about the ASUS dial support is that we have an integrated essentially kind of level of functionality that can work in two levels. One, it can tie in directly to programs. So if you're running like Adobe applications, um, like Lightroom or Photoshop or things like that, you can actually see direct kind of palette or options available to you when you adjust the dial. Um, it can also be remapped to Windows. Uh, so Windows actually has a dial level of functionality built into Windows. So you could actually use application hooks for this as well if you set it to Windows dial mode. So you have kind of two different modes. You have essentially kind of the productivity mode, which can hook into professional applications. And then you have a customization option that which can hook into the Windows dial mode. So that is up to you. Now keep in mind that is independent of the general EMR function, which would be the stylus, as well as the 10 point functionality. Now the unit also will introduce what we call our control panel support, uh, which we've now had on a number of our ProArt series monitors. The cool thing about the ProArt series of support is, is that you actually can have a full kind of GUI or essentially user interface for control for those specific applications. Uh, that can be pretty cool because again, you could actually have like a full option to be able to control, um, you know, let's say like a contrast or brightness or saturation or different things along those lines all within the operating system environment. Um, so you can actually see right here where there's actually all these touch controls for if you're maybe a Photoshop user, you can use the ProArt Creator Hub and instead of having to have a secondary keyboard or matching out to different kind of macros, you could literally be using this as like a secondary input option, right? Um, so that that Pro Creator Hub is actually then leveraging that 10 point touch functionality. So that is pretty cool. And that's also something that we've continued to enhance in terms of the Pro Creator Hub where there's been more application support. Um, and if you have any applications you'd like to see be integrated, feel free to go ahead and leave feedback to our team so that we can look at um, offering that. We do also offer an SDK so it can be developed for other companies if they wanna be able to leverage kind of creating um, hooks for the actual control center interface for that, okay? so. That is going to be uh, the PA169CDV. And I will go ahead and show just because some people are wondering if they like this model, but maybe it's a little bit more than they need. Do keep in mind that we also have the PA14CDV. Uh, so let me 
show this one, and then we also have yeah, here we go. So we have a couple of different models here, so I'll show you here. So this is the uh, model is at 399. And this one's going to give you pretty much very similar functionality. This one, though, goes down to 14 inches, 1080p, factory calibrated, USB-C, 10-point touch, and the ASU style. So very similar level of kind of functionality as that other model, except it doesn't have the EMR and it doesn't have the, the 4K, right? And it's a little bit uh, smaller, right? So 14 inches versus 15.6 inches. But this is a really nice option. And again, you have that integrated kickstand. Really nice option, again, because you can use this with anything if you want to pair it to a camera, if you want to pair it to a system, because that mini HDMI input, you've got tons of flexibility. We then also have the slim 32 by 9 ultra wide offering which is going to be here the cdv option which will have a non-standard resolution 1920 by 550 this one is really cool again if you want to have this as a secondary based uh, kind of display there where again you could use it for control panel interface it supports mppt which does mean that you can use it kind of with like an input stylus type of option as well it has the asus child it has 10 point touch and this one also can be utilized with a vertical display and horizontal display. So this is actually pretty cool. I actually have one set up where I get it for like email. I can see actually like different types of chats, social feeds. I really like running it in a vertical orientation as opposed to a horizontal vertical, uh, as, as opposed to a horizontal uh, orientation. So a lot of flexibility here. So you'll also see that there's an integrated fixed stand here, which is pretty cool. So it's a freestanding access. So you can pretty much pull it in and out and it will auto lock into place. Um, I really love this model. It's very easy to also go ahead and load in. So those are essentially a couple of different options that we have within the ProArt series of portable displays. All right, guys. Any quick feedback there? Hey, Jason Porter, thanks for your feedback. Uh, appreciate that. Yeah, I think, you know, these are really cool models and definitely we spent a lot of time and effort on the ProArt series to be able to try to offer something I think gives you uh, an enhanced kind of user experience. And definitely I think the, the quality is really great, especially if you care about color accuracy. Like for me, that's a big thing I love. I love really kind of clear colors, right? I want accurate colors. I want good color space. And then I love the flexibility in terms of all the options that I've got for touch or I got for different input options, things along those lines. All right. All right. Uh, link for the last panel. Yeah, sure. Let me actually go ahead and I'll drop all of them in the chat. So this is the I'll drop these all accordingly. And so this is going to be for the 14 CDV. So the 14 CDV is going to be for the 32 by 9, right? 14 inch. OK, I will drop that one in there. And then we'll drop in here. It'll be for the um, for the new model, right? For the uh, 16 CDV. So let me go ahead and put in the 16 CDV. Are all these available? Yes, all of these are North America. Remember, pretty much everything I talk about is only going to be specific to uh, North America, right? If you guys are asking about another region, I can't uh, necessarily communicate whether or not we are going to have that in another region. You have to check it with your ASUS in your region, okay? All right, so there we go. All three of those models have been dropped there in the chat. All right. All right, let's go into the next item here. It's going to be the another ProArt series display. It's going to be this guy, the ProArt. PA 34 VCNV. All right, so let's go ahead and bring this guy up. PA 34. So this is going to be a 21 by 9, 34.1 um, inch, I believe, is going to be the aspect ratio here. And this one actually will also have a curve. It's got actually some pretty cool stuff. It actually has, well, we'll talk about that. So here you guys can see. So this is going to be 21, point, uh, 21 by 9 aspect ratio, 3440 by 1440, a 3800 uh, curvature. Okay. Um, and then from there, you can see 100% sRGB and Rec. 709. So outstanding color accuracy. Color accuracy is factory calibrated out of the box. So that is going to be par for the course for all ProArt series displays. Remember, if you're kind of ever confused, Tough Gaming can have actually very good color gamut coverage, but is never factory calibrated. ROG Strix displays are all factory calibrated, and then all ProArt displays are also factory calibrated. ProArt displays, though, do also have additional benefits in terms of uniformity and also having more advanced 
color access controls such as they have like six color access controls and they have more options in terms of what you can customize for things like what we call our pro art palette and pro art presets so there's more con customization that essentially we afford creators in terms of how they make adjustments to their workflow now some of the cool things you're going to see here is going to be uh, i think one usb-c docking support so the usb-c docking support um, one that just by default means that outside of your traditional connectivity you can of course connect this to something like a mini pc or to like a laptop and you would be able to use a single display to provide power and also the display signal up to 96 watts is great because that's going to be very comparable for a lot of our laptops whether you're like an apple user or whether you've got something like a zen book or a g14 right uh, or a vivo book or a studio book right now this is pretty interesting because this is something that you might have not kind of seen traditionally and we've started to put on some of our other monitors which is integrated rj45 connectivity so that's the reason why we call it docking support because when you also connect that cable there's actually an ethernet port on the display so you could actually have wired ethernet connected to the monitor and then when you connect that to the system you would then also also be able to provide ethernet connectivity so that's pretty cool um, in terms of just mitigating right having to have more cables connected and especially for laptop users not really an issue for desktop users but for laptop users they m probably don't have an ethernet port on the laptop uh, unless it's maybe one of our larger like gaming laptops uh, where you still traditionally see ethernet ports on them right so pretty slick in that regard. Of course, thin bezel based design, pass through design there for your cable management support. You do have, of course, uh, Visa mounting. So you can go ahead and mount this if you'd like, but we have a very nice high quality stand that's also on here. Now, one of the other things that's pretty cool that you may not be aware of that we do on the ProArt series is that they have quite a bit of rich connectivity. So if we uh, go over here, let me see here if I can bring it up. Um, let's go ahead, sorry here. I don't know if I have the close up image here on this one I think we'll have to go into the tech specs on it um, but there is actually going to be um, excuse me there's going to be robust flexibility when it comes to the actual USB so sometimes on some monitors you'll see that you get like one USB port or something like that but with a lot of the pro art displays we I try to give you actually quite a bit of connectivity so you can see right here HDMI display port now this display port MST this is actually important to understand very few monitors have display port MST MST essentially means that you have daisy chaining support so instead of having to go back and connect that to your graphics card or another display out on the device you can daisy chain from that primary display so if you're going to be running actually two displays side by side right and this is actually the case for a lot of our pro art C, C uh, excuse me uh, CV models is they all have that flexibility is they all have the daisy chain support so if you wanted to put like 227 inches together 224s or 232s you could daisy chain them together so you don't have to run another cable back to the graphics card you can just run it to the monitor and they will daisy chain together um, then you have the USB-C the RJ45 the USB hub which is just a traditional USB hub which you could use for like a camera you could use it for like a NAS for like a printer for a storage device for whatever and then a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack okay um, the, of course, the ergonomics are quite nice where you have height adjustment, tilt, and swivel are all going to be present on there. But I do want to head over here and go over to the tech specs. So let me head over here to the tech specs. It also does include speakers. These are not super powerful speakers, but they're fine for watching things like, you know, a basic podcast or maybe like a stream, maybe something like watching the PC DIY stream, listen to a little bit of music, things like that. But you'll see here in terms of the port connectivity outside of that USB-C port, you actually have also three uh, three other ports. So you have your type A and your type C. So um, quite flexible in terms of also giving you, like I said, options for the number of devices that you might want to physically connect to the monitor. All right. So that is going to be the PA34VCNB. Now we do also have some other ProArt series displays, again, that are non-curved. If you don't want to go non-curved and you still want ultra wide, again, we have tons of ProArt series displays. So you can check those out on the corresponding website if you are going to be interested. Okay. Um, Michael's asking is the LAN, it's one gigabits LAN, it's not 2.5 gigabits LAN because the vast majority of individuals in this, in this respective space aren't generally going to be using 2.5 gigabit, right? Um, so yes, it is one gigabits in terms of that. Um, daisy chaining seems to be all forgotten. Yeah, um, I would say like on traditional monitors, you don't see it at all. But yeah, in the at least in our professional displays, it's a very common feature. Part of it is also there's cost at, at integrating the scaler support to have that functionality. Um, so you're always trying to balance out, uh, you know, the scaler and the feature set that that device might have, right? Whether you need to be able to have DP 2.1 or HDMI 2.1 or whether it has a G-Sync module or, you know, there's so many other kind of factors that evaluate, at least for gaming related displays. But 
for our ProRite series displays, we feel having the daisy chain functionality is quite valuable, especially because it's quite a bit more common for the professionals, although we're seeing a lot of normal users also move to having multi-monitor configurations. But in professionals, it's very common for them to also be considering multiple monitors. Now with something like this, like a 34 inch uh, curved monitor, you're probably not gonna run two of these, but uh, we think that probably for like our traditional ProArt series, so like the 24 inch, um, the 27 inch, and the 32 inch, um, those all would be kind of more standard for users to probably go with some form of daisy chaining approach. Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead and cover that one. So let me go ahead and drop that one in the chat there. Okay. So we've gone ahead and dropped that one in there. So now let's see what else we've got here. Um, we touched on the graphics card, touched on the monitors, we touched on the Hyper uh, M.2 adding card. Okay, so we've got our mini PC and then we're gonna round out with those motherboards, right? So let's go ahead and go into the mini PC PB63. So keep in mind as always for our mini PCs, right? Um, with our mini PCs, we have generally what are referred to as our BB models. So BB models means that there's a bare bone model and then there's a system model. For generally pretty much all of the models that we do carry, we have both BB models and we have bare bones, excuse me, we have bare bone models and we have system related models. So you do, if you're interested in going for the bare bone model, you can look on the website and see if there's a bare bone option. And the fundamental difference is bare bones means that there's no, that there's no uh, DRAM and there's no storage and there's no operating system. All of the other spec is fixed, including the CPU. So usually we will offer usually like three tiers of CPU support. So something like uh, we have both Intel and AMD solutions, but imagine like an i3, like an i5 and like an i7 or something like that as an example, right? Um, system models means that you have the same thing where you have the CPU, but it's also going to come with memory. It'll come with storage. So it'll come with an SSD and then it will also come with the operating system. Okay. So the PB63 is actually a little bit more kind of closer to maybe some of our business centric models, the PN models, which I talked recently about the PN models. Those are my favorite models that we have, which are very compact. We have those with Intel and AMD based offerings. And uh, right now for our Ryzen launch, for the PN series models, we have everything including the latest generation Ryzen 7000 series. We also have Ryzen 6000 series. You have uh, Gen 4 support that's also available to you on those models. You can have up to four displays, 2.5 gigabit networking, Wi-Fi 6E, a lot of really cool stuff. PB models tend to be a little bit larger and they will also usually incorporate a higher spec CPU in terms of the power envelope. So the wattage envelope will be a little bit higher. So if we take a look at here, um, this model at 749 will I believe be a 13500 uh, series CPU. So that's actually the latest 13th gen. You get Wi-Fi 6E, so very, very fast Wi-Fi, 2.5 gigabit LAN. Uh, you also then have two high-speed PCI Gen 4x4 M.2 NVMe SSD support. And you also have, of course, 4K support, which is supported uh, directly on the iGPU. Uh, very nice, very easy to work with. Um, it's very easy to actually access and install, right? So you, these are high-speed ports right here. So you can see you've got your USB-C, two type A, and another two type A. So a total of five ports on the front, microphone, and um, line in, right? Uh, ventilation's all present right there. Now you do have the flexibility. You can go ahead and orient this in horizontal or vertical based form factor. Does also have mounting support for directly on the back of a display. Uh, it's also pretty nice right there. This front USB port, I do want to note, it's pretty rare on mini PCs. This is a 20 gigabit based port. So it's pretty rare. Most mini PCs are probably going to be limited to five gigabit. We've had other models that also have 10 gigabit, but it's very rare to find 20 gigabit. So that does feature a 20 gigabit USB port. Um, now, in some of the new models, we've also been incorporating advanced kind of dust filter based designs. You can see that right there where it's also very easy to disassemble and access the dust filter. So if maybe you're putting it like in a workshop or you're putting it in an environment that might have maybe a higher likelihood of having dust debris or dander and you want to be able to clear that out, having the dust filter is nice. Most mini PCs haven't had that. We also have new mini PCs in the PN series that actually have what's called the dust channel as part of the fan design where essentially as dust debris and dander comes in, there's actually a secondary channel on the inside of the fan housing where actually that kind of particulate settles into that other space and gets exhausted back out of the chassis. Um, that helps to reduce the likelihood of the internal heat sink kind of getting stopped up with kind of subtle dust debris and dander over time, okay? Um, rounding out the rest of the connectivity, again, we can see right here, 20 gigabits, type A, which are five gigabits, and then USB 2 your audio jack, your mic in, uh, optional speaker right here, antenna, right, Wi-Fi 6E, DC power in. 
you can see display port and display port now you can easily adapt this where you can adapt this to hdmi with the display port hdmi cable although check the specs for the model we on occasion do have regionally specific models where we might swap out having like a dp and then like an hdmi port usb 2 10 gigabit usb ports so these are going to be 10 so again this is 20 5 and 10 so in total you've got five high speed ports there and then you've got, of course, three more uh, just standard USB 2 ports. This configurable port will generally vary. Um, I will check on what the connection is for this, but I believe this on, a, on our model, this should be a HDMI port, I believe. And then RJ45, okay? There is also an optional accessory for those who might still be using an optical drive and the secondary visa. All right, so that is gonna be the PB63 system model. But again, we do have varying models as far as bare bones, and non bare bone based models. Okay. Uh, Michael notes, uh, like the design. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I like I said, I like the the PN models. Some of the other cool things on the PN models, the PN models because they also use generally a little bit lower wattage CPU. You can also do like PD input, which means you can actually even power the unit via USB C. So if like, you wanted to have the flexibility of like powering that from like a power bank or from like an actual display. So we have monitors that have USB PD support. You could actually even power the mini PC. So you can literally have a mini PC mount it to the back of the monitor and be able to do that. So that's actually pretty cool. I'm a fan of having that type of flexibility. All right. All right, so let's uh, round things out here with some other boards. All right, so this is gonna be for our, essentially, we're just gonna do a quick recap. I'm not gonna touch on these because I already kind of talked about them a little bit. And of course, uh, coming up shortly, um, in the not too distant future, we have our dedicated live stream where we'll have a full overview on all of our refresh series models. We'll talk about the features, function, design differences. And I did recap these a little bit in the prior introduction live stream, so you can jump into that. But if anybody has any questions, at least on these models, feel free to go ahead and ask. So. Let's go ahead and go into it. Uh, let me jump in here and show you which ones we are gonna be touching on. All right, so uh, in terms of what we've already announced, we do we did note we are gonna have three new models. Uh, like I said, we've got some other announcements that are gonna be coming in the not too distant future. So you can see right here, the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero, which will be coming in at 699. The ROG Strix Z790-A Gaming Wi-Fi 2, which will be coming in at 399. And then the Tough Gaming Z790 Pro Wi-Fi, which I think is gonna be my sleeper favorite that I'm gonna be recommending to a lot of people in the community coming in at 299. And a really cool update that we've got for this generation, specifically for Tough Gaming that I'm really excited about, is that this board will finally now come with Asus AIOC and AI cooling. Traditionally, we have only offered ASUS AIOC on the ROG Strix, as excuse me, um, as well as on the, of course, ROG Maxima series. Uh, we have had it on select prime models at different times and then also on pro art, but we've never offered it on tough gaming. So to be able to have now tough gaming have our most advanced automated overclocking technology with ASUS AIOC, I'm really excited about. So pretty cool in terms of that respect. So let's go ahead and uh, take a little bit of a closer look at here some of the boards and we'll jump into it. So let me go ahead and uh, get my images here. Oh, what happened there? Oh, let me see right here. Give me a second, guys. Put my flash drive right there. And I think I have my images here, okay. There we go, okay. So let's go ahead and take first a closer look here at the uh, Tough Gaming Wi-Fi will kind of go from like the entry to like the higher end side. So this is gonna be the Tough Gaming. Has a slight bit of an ID overhaul design. Uh, for the most part, it's gonna look pretty similar to the current Z790 Plus. Now keep in mind, we'll probably for the foreseeable future still have the Z790 Plus available. And we have the Z790 Plus in both the DDR4 and a DDR5. This new model will be only DDR5, so keep that in mind. Um, now, as far as kind of the main, let's say upgrades that you're gonna have here, um, I would say one of them is gonna be that this will be 20 gigabits USB on the internal USB-C connection. Uh, we have the new actually push fit design for the Q antenna technology. So that's gonna be a much easier way to just be able to go ahead and push in the antenna. It actually improves the overall signal performance. And we have then our new software suite, which actually helps you to um, 
have more information resident to actually your Wi-Fi and, and making adjustments to that. And you're also going to have the AI cooling and Asus AIC. So those are going to be some of the biggest kind of differentiation points for the most part. Uh, otherwise, everything else is going to be pretty similar. It still has up to four PCIe NVMe SSDs that can be supported. No PCI Gen 5 M.2 SSDs. Keep in mind that moves up into the higher tier. This is a PCI Express Gen 5 slot. Uh, we made a slight revision to the VRM power topology with uh, an improvement for the actual iGPU. So to be able to have a little bit more power in that respect, but otherwise uh, power delivery was already still very capable. So regardless of whether you want to run stock or overclocked, whatever CPU you want, there's not going to be any issues. You don't ever have to feel that you're going to be constrained by picking the tough gaming versus like the ROG Strix or the ROG Maximus board when it comes to stability or reliability. So a great foundation, great option, right? That we're going to have there with the tough gaming Z790 Pro. Okay. And just here, so you guys can see the rear connection, you got HDMI, DP, 10 gigabits USB right here, five gigabits for the USB type A ports there, another five gigabits, and then another 10 gigabits. So all of the ports actually in totality on this board, they're all high speed. There's no low speed ports. So 10, five, five, 10, and 20, 2.5G, Wi-Fi 6C, of course, with Bluetooth support and that new push fit and design. And then also keep in mind, it's pretty rare amongst a lot of other competitors' entry boards, but uh, tough gaming boards still continue to come with the DTS Audio Suite, which gives you a more advanced EQ as well as specialized sound profiles as well for the tough gaming isolated audio design, okay? So that is going to be the tough gaming Z790 Pro. All right, uh, let me go ahead and quickly see any quick questions that we got there. So I hear refresh plans for, I'm not sure what you mean, Michael, by your question. Um, these are part of our refresh boards for Z790. So I already touched on these when we first announced them. Um, but like I said, we have some other models that we may be uh, looking to talk about in the not too distant future as well, all right? Uh, Q antenna, would the Q antenna be an upgrade option for existing motherboards? No, because the design actually like the firmware and the interconnect and everything else is specific to that. And there's also new controllers that we're using on the, uh, the network controllers that we're utilizing for Wi-Fi. So that feature uh, in totality is specific to the newest generation of motherboards. So you will not have this specific Q antenna technology feature be available on older series motherboards, even though other motherboards that we have with had like Wi-Fi 6E. Uh, you can still get a great experience there, but for sure this is going to be an, an easier experience when you talk about um, being able to kind of push in the antenna as opposed to having to have the screw fitment design for the SMA antenna, right? Uh, love that the IO on the tough gaming board, right? Um, SD goes, which cheap not gaming motherboard is good to work for a long time. So if you didn't want to go with tough gaming and you're just looking for a solid system, my recommendation is take a look at the Prime. This is the model that I have right here next to me. This is our Prime Z790-A. We also do have the Dash P if you wanted to even look for a kind of little bit of a lower cost option, but I'm really big fan of always our, our Dash A model on the Prime series. So I would take a look at that. And also, if you don't really have a focus for overclocking support with Z series, take a look at B series chipsets. So you could take a look at models like B760 base models, which I think are also another good choice for you. Okay. Facebook user is talking about a motherboard that we have not officially announced. So I'm just going to tell you, make sure to go ahead and keep uh, taking a closer look uh, at what we have coming out in the not too distant future. Okay. <laughs> Somebody says that uh, this X motherboard is going to be really tempting my resolve. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, just make sure to keep it tuned. All right, guys. All right. So next board uh, we're going to touch on here is we're going to step up now in the stack. We're going to go with the ROG Strix Z790-A Gaming Wi-Fi 2. So let's go ahead and take a look at that guy. Go ahead and bring this one up here. So, of course, uh, the big claim for fame here, this board has been a very popular board since we introduced the Dash A designation as kind of always being our white offering within the ROG Strix lineup. So in the past, we've had models like we've had the ROG Strix, um, you know, we've had everything from the Dash I to the Dash F to the Dash E. Uh, we've occasionally even had a Dash H, right? Um, but the Dash A has been very popular from not only at its price point position, but also because it's offering uh, white themed builders, a great option to have a bold and bright board that also has a really great feature set in terms of its features, functions, and core specifications. So you can see we carry over already what we were doing with the Dash A. You know, you get the Asus AIC support, you get the Supreme FX audio design, you get that ROG class UEFI. You get really great things like the Q release, although keep in mind the Q release is also still on the Tough Gaming motherboard. If you're not familiar with Q release, it just means that there's a physical 
physical button that you can press on the motherboard that ejects the graphics card. So it's pretty cool. Um, if I bring up my Apex board that I've got right here, um, right, it's actually pretty slick. So there's a little button right here. You can just press this. And when you press this, this will actually allow you to just remove the graphics card. So really nice and convenient for when you have to add something like an M.2 SSD or you have to make a tweak or adjustment. You don't have to worry about getting, you know, like an ESD spludger tool or something like that or a credit card or a flathead screwdriver and trying to push down on the socket to eject the card. You can just press that and do that. So that was a great innovation that we introduced on Z690 series, but we, of course, carry that through to Z790 series. Um, you have uh, the reinforced USB 3 header, you have the USB-C header as well there, and you can see you've got four M.2 SSDs, all with their own, of course, dedicated heat sinks as well, and that really nice, cool, clean, bold ID design that we have on, of course, our RG Strix uh, boards, right? Now, when you take a look here at the rear I.O., you're going to see that you're going to be stepping up to even a higher grade of rear I.O. You can actually see that cool push fit push fit antenna design or again the great thing here is you don't have to do you don't have to screw anything in you just simply push it in and you'll be good to go now that is going to be one of the big differentiation points uh compared to the prior models you get wi-fi 7 and also compared to the tough gaming board that's going to be another update as you move over to wi-fi 7 when we take a look here at the rear io you can see that you've got the clear cmos that's actually something that we also push to incorporate historically we have not offered clear cmos on dash a so we did that with the prior refresh model as well i was really excited to be able to push our team and be able to get uh, clear CMOS introduced on this where normally we've only had it on higher end SKU. So you get the clear CMOS, you get the BIOS flashback, DP, HDMI. Uh, you then of course have four legacy type A ports, right? That are USB 2. These are all going to be five gigabits type A ports. Then you have 20 gigabits type C, 10 gigabits type A, 10, uh, excuse me, uh, then you have another type C and another uh, type A. And these, I believe, are five gigabits, right? So 2.5G. So a total of, you can see, eight ports there. So a little bit more than what you have on the Tough Gaming Board, along with also having Wi-Fi 7, all right? So a uh, nice number of updates there. So that is going to be the Tough Gaming, excuse me, um, that is going to be the ROG Strix um, dash a gaming Wi-Fi 2. Now, one thing I wanted to show right here is as we remove the heat sinks, another upgrade here is you're going to see is that when you take a look at the board, um, traditionally the more entry RG Strix boards have not had the, what is referred to as the dual contact M.2 SSD design. So that dual contact SSD design is favorable uh, when you have essentially, like I said, larger capacity M.2 SSDs, right? Which have NAND on the front and on the back. The Tough Gaming Board, all of the slots will pretty much look like this, where you could fit those drives on there, but it's not gonna have a dual heatsink design. So this one does have a dual heatsink design for that primary uh, PCIe MVME M.2 SSD slot. So I just wanted to show you guys that there is that's one of those benefits that you're gonna get is that dual contact base design, okay? And that's going to be most advantageous, of course, for those uh, that are going to be running very high speed PCI Express Gen 4 or, of course, um, you know, even the higher speed based drives, right? So that is going to be the ROG Strix Z790-A Gaming Wi-Fi 2, okay? Let me see if we got any questions that might have came up on there. Uh, Michael notes is I wish that I could be a fly on the Asus engineering kitchen walls. Yeah, a lot of really great conversations. Some of my favorite things, you know, I've, I recently celebrated not that long ago over 15 years with Asus. And it's one of the reasons why I love still being with the company is we have an amazing, uh, amazing set of teams from everything from our ID team, which helps to design the actual look and the design of our products to our VRM team, to our thermal team, to our power delivery team, our overclocking team, um, so many great things and some of the conversations that we do for stuff that we're thinking about in terms of conceptualizing feature function spec products. Um, it's most, some of the most exciting conversations to be part of, especially when you're in a, a PC DIY enthusiast. So pretty cool. Um, I hope that the next motherboards also come in BTF. Keep in mind, we already talked about BTF and we will have Intel BTF based solutions uh, later on. But uh, for this specific refresh, none of the products that we're going to be noting on will be BTF. So we did already touch on BTF in one of the prior streams. So if you guys are interested in that, check out one of our prior streams where we talk about the latest generation of BTF where I gave you guys visibility to that. And if you guys don't know what the BTF is, that is the back to the future. That is essentially the motherboards that don't have any connectors on the front of the motherboard. The connectors are on the back of the motherboard. So if you want that proverbial cleaner aesthetic, to me, I don't really care. Actually, I like sometimes seeing cables. I like the colors. I like the contrast. So I'm on hashtag team cable. Let me know in the chat. Are you hashtag team cable? Or are you hashtag team no cable, right? Which one might you be? Um, 
why does the graphics card not have socket SD? I'm not sure on your question. If you could rephrase your question, um, and I will try to do my best to go ahead and answer. Um, is it only DDR5 or DDR4? So yes, so in the past, we've had the Dash A model be offered in DDR4 and a DDR5. This model is exclusively DDR5. So uh, the best way to always know whether it supports DDR4 or DDR5 is when you do not see DDR4 in the naming scheme, which would be D4, that means it's only DDR5. So if you look at any of our other models that are DDR4, it would be like Tough Gaming plus D4. And that would mean that it's a DDR4 based motherboard. So because here you don't see any D4 designation, that inherently means it's a, a DDR5 motherboard. So all of our refresh motherboards, especially now because DDR5 pricing has gone down considerably since it originally launched. Um, it, and also really you get the best performance. If you talk about multi-threaded performance, um, you want actually the bandwidth that can be applied per cores. With DDR4, you're actually significantly reducing the bandwidth per core for multi-threaded performance. Um, so yeah, if you really want the best experience, DDR5 is the way to go. So yeah, DDR5 is on all the refresh boards, okay? What are the model numbers of the motherboards with built-in graphics card power connectors? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, A White. If you can clarify what you mean by that question, built-in power connectors. Are you talking about the BTF models? So you're talking about the one with the actual built-in connector for the BTF-based graphics card. So the ones that have the PCI Express and the supplemental power. Right now, we've only announced one model, which is going to be the BTF model. So it would actually be called the... Right now, for us in North America, the model that we're looking to release will be the Tough Gaming... Um, Z790 BTF. So I think I, I think I show this off. I guess I can show it off here quickly uh, for those that might be interested. So an example here is the BTF based like one of our demo systems here that we showed with the Tough Gaming. So you'll see there's no cables because this motherboard actually has the connector for PCI Express and for the power for the graphics card on the graphics card and on the board, right? And so that is all interfaced in there. So yes. Okay. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and go now lastly to our last model, and we'll go to the last model, which is going to be for the um, ROG. Let's go ahead and throw ROG in there. The ROG Maximus C790 Dark Hero, which will be coming in at 699 So that will be pretty much our flagship series board there, um, as it is in the Maximus series lineup. And so let me go ahead and bring up our images here. All right, so there we go. So you can see the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero. So again, I don't want to spend too much time talking on it. I talked about a little bit about it in our prior introduction. And of course, we'll have our full in-depth live stream. Where we'll talk about all the ins and outs, recapping all the design features. But the big updates here, of course, are you're going to have things like native PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support, where the prior generation, you actually had to do it through a PCI add-in card. Um, you can also see things like the actual slot spacing for the GPU is quite a bit different, where it also supports dual um, high speed PCI Express Gen 5 slots where most of the other motherboards you're going to see they only have one slot and then the other slot they wouldn't have like a high speed secondary slot. The advantage to that too is sometimes what we find is that some users for different reasons aesthetically maybe they'll mount the GPU here versus mounting the GPU there. Um, and keep in mind that from like a, you know, putting it in a water block even if you ran a 4090 at by 8 it is effectively the same exact performance as by 16. So there's no performance penalty to running it in by 8 versus in by 16. Um, but Keep in mind that it's going to be one of the differentiation points. So you have the Polymo lighting display. You have the 60 watt power, right, for the internal USB-C, which is going to be utilizing the Quick Charge 4 Plus technology. Um, of course, you're going to have robust uh, PCIe NVMe M.2 SSD support. You'll also notice things like dual front USB 3 internal headers. That's a pretty much a rarity amongst motherboards. Most motherboards only have one internal USB 3 header, but most, most chassis only have one USB 3 header as well. So this is kind of more targeted towards higher end boards. You have subtle things also, things like here, like the PCI alteration mode switch, which if you guys see this little switch right here, um, that's really optimally suited for debugging cases with like riser cables. Sometimes you might into a situation where you have like a flaky or marginal riser cable. There's a different setting configuration and the system won't post or output correctly. So normally you literally have to like disconnect the cable, go to your internal iGPU, then boot, make changes and then reboot. But now you can just actually toggle this from running from like PCI Express Gen 4 mode to PCI Express Gen 3 mode so that it can actually output. You can also change 
the fan controls to work with this switch. So you can have like low, medium, or high. So you could go in the UEFI and you could actually use this like a basic fan controller, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, of course, USB connectivity, this will be the highest board connectivity, which will include USB 4 and Thunderbolt protocol support. Um, and there's a whole lot more that I, I won't get into in terms of this board. Beautiful backplate also on the Dark Hero as well. Um, and some really cool features that, again, in the live stream, will be talking about. So make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned there. But there you can just see, of course, uh, very much high spec, right? So you can see the clear CMOS, the USB bus flashback, HDMI, and all high speed ports. So there's a type A, type A, type A, type A, five gigabits, 10 gigabits, Thunderbolt. So this is Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt, and USB-C. So all of these are all three high speed based ports. So 10 gigabits, 40 gigabits, 40 gigabits, along with being Thunderbolt, type A, type A, type A, that's uh, 10, 10, 10, and 10, and 10, 2.5G. And then the most advanced version of Wi-Fi 7 with up to 320 megahertz band support, along with our most advanced version of Q antenna. Uh, we even have a more advanced version of the heatsink assembly for the PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSDs uh, that are also gonna be on this board. So that is going to be the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero, okay? Um, so this is actually true and it's not true. So you, when you go Thunderbolt 4 should have interoperability with USB 4. Um, technically, yes, but they are not the same. The actual protocols in terms of how they allocate bandwidth are actually quite different. So technically you can have a USB 4 port which isn't actually, actually Thunderbolt. Um, so this is actually becomes a little bit more complicated depending on the device and the controller that you also utilize in the device. So a client based device that might be Thunderbolt based, but not be USB four. So there's a lot of semantics and kind of complexity when you get into um, protocols for USB and kind of their specification support and even kind of things like where you talk about bot protocol and UASP and a lot of those things like that. Actually in the future, maybe maybe do a dedicated stream on kind of providing some perspective on that because some people actually still kind of get confused about some of those things. Um, but overall, I best think the best way to think about it is that you just have ultra high speed bandwidth available to you to those ports. Most users also though, we generally find aren't actually using Thunderbolt on desktop ATX based systems. Um, it's more common of course within laptop based systems but in the high-end enthusiast segment, we may see users that might have maybe one of our like uh, Thunderbolt enabled monitors, or maybe they might have something like an external Thunderbolt storage device that they might want to connect. So that's part of the reason why we look to also incorporate that USB or Thunderbolt spec on select models, right? Um, keep in mind though, that also a wide range of our models also generally will have the TB header. So the TB header is a header that's on the motherboard that would allow you to add Thunderbolt 4 to the motherboard via specialized adding card. So if you wanted that functionality, you can do that. All right. Um, Astro Sky goes, we have no plans to refresh. Um, there wasn't really a reason to refresh it right now because AM5 is brand new and that board has very, very high premium spec. The reason why we refreshed um, originally for AM4 is because the original Crosshair had been out for a really long period of time and there was an opportunity to introduce new features like dynamic OC switcher and stuff like that. But that board already even has all those features and there's even way more new features that we introduced specific to that. So we have no immediate plans. We actually have the most comprehensive AM5 lineup of any motherboard manufacturer we spent considerable effort at actually defining um, kind of board investment strategy at really offering an amazing stack there so yeah there's no plans to do any refreshes for am5 items okay uh, michael goes i missed the display well this one wouldn't have a display the hero has never had a display on the top of the m.2 we've only ever offered like an oled live dash display on higher models so models like the formula or the extreme have had had the oled live dash display but we've never done an oled live dash display on a hero class motherboard so that has been always kind of a differentiation between the higher and maximum series so for a long time you guys probably remember i had like a Maximus Extreme, Z690, and Z790 that I had here, and that one you would always see the OLED Live Dash display. But um, along with, like I said, the formula, those are the only two models that we've ever done the OLED Live Dash display. Um, but the Hero has never had the OLED Live Dash display. Yeah, I don't know. Um, this is an interesting question. It's not really relevant to us because we're on the desktop side, so users don't have to account for this. But I can tell you, you know, hopefully t Thunderbolt should make um, external GPUs viable. They're already viable. The reality, though, that is a consistent challenge, and it will always be a challenge in the same way that it's a challenge for laptops, is 
you have moving targets when it comes to power and thermals, right? So regardless of the bandwidth improvement that you're gonna get from even a newer specification, it doesn't resolve the challenges of manufacturing and making closures that give you enough power envelope and thermal accommodations to be able to support GPUs. And then realistically, just there isn't really the actual demand. I think some enthusiasts kind of keep asking for this, but when we generally see feedback, and keep in mind, we understand this feedback genuinely really well because we're really kind of one of the absolute premier manufacturers worldwide of gaming laptops. We just generally don't see that many users really consciously going, I'm going to invest in having a whole nother external GPU solution, right, to supplement the GPU that comes in my system, even though in the desktop market, so many users just think about that as a normal pathway to upgrade, right? They go like, hey, I had, you know, a 2060 and now I'm going to upgrade to a 4070, right? And I think even while users might have that, it just tends to be that the methodology for what users consider is quite different, right? They kind of just go like, hey, in another two and a half years, I might maybe just buy a new laptop because it's also going to have a better screen. It might have a new keyboard. It might have, you know, better resolution, a higher refresh rate. It might have new Wi-Fi. It might have more ports, right? They, they just have a different kind of fundamental approach. Um, you know, from our perspective, of course, I think we're going to continue to support the latest specification support as an industry leader in that regard. But I don't know necessarily that you're going to see the impetus of just offering so many more solutions and seeing people commonly utilize external GPUs. Um, and that's, again, that we're one of the really biggest supporters, right? Like the RG Ally, um, you know, we designed it to even be able to utilize an external GPU solution, right? Um, even though we went with our own solution because it offered much more bandwidth than Thunderbolt, right? And that's the other thing that a lot of people don't get is that because of the way that the protocol works, the actual handling experience can be quite variable. It's not as seamless as it is in a normal system where you can have irregularities with kind of output wrapping and resolution support and just like a lot of variables that just are not as seamless as they should be. I think Thunderbolt makes most sense for a lot of the more professional, semi-professional workflow considerations for users that are looking for high speed storage, GPU acceleration, you know, 2.5G, 10G add-in cards, right? Um, daisy chain configurations, things like that. And that's where we actually really see the most of the usage in the market. And that's where you see most of the development of accessories in the market as well, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so overall guys, that uh, wraps up our three new boards. So again, that is gonna give you the recap there. So let me go ahead and just show you um, the three there. Go ahead and recap there. So we got the... Uh, <clears throat> ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero, the ROG Strix Z790-A Gaming Wi-Fi 2, and the Tough Gaming Z790 Pro Wi-Fi. So $299, $399, and $699. And as you guys probably already saw that I showed there in our little bit of our teaser for our upcoming live stream, which will be on the 16th, make sure to keep it tuned because we've got more announcements that are going to be coming if you're interested in Z790 based refresh. So um, yeah, make sure to keep it tuned there. We've got some cool stuff that is going to be coming up. And as always, I'm excited to be able to go ahead and talk about them. All right, guys. So I think that wraps up all the new products that we had to go ahead and touch on. Let me go ahead and quickly check on my notes here. Uh, I don't think there was any other questions that might have popped in there, but I will check in a moment. So give me one second. So yes, uh, we got our motherboards. We got our dual RX 560. We got our monitors out of the way. We got our mini PC. We got our Hyper M.2 add-in card also covered. Uh, we got our UEFI BIOS updates. So yeah, that takes care of everything. Uh, let me quickly see any quick feedback right there. Michael notes, uh, some U.2 connectors on the next extreme. I would agree with you. Just sadly, we just don't see users appreciating or asking for us a U.2. Trust me, I've pushed our team that I'd like us to actually have U.2 um, on our boards because, like I said, for me personally, the way I do it is I just buy like a PCI add-in card and then I add in my U.2 drive and I put it into PCIe slot. Um, it's so much better than M.2, right? Because one, I can get higher densities. I don't use multiple PCI Express lanes. I'm not thermally constrained. I'm not power constrained. But... Uh, right now, I think there's just too much traction amongst the community and amongst media on always defaulting to say M.2 is the best a storage solution. And that's that it's a great specification, it's a great technology, and it's one that we've been ad big advocates at supporting, hence why so many of our boards have such extensive M.2 support. And we've done things like, you know, the, uh, you know, DIM.2 add-in card, the Gen Z.2 add-in card, all this stuff to be able to enable better experience for M.2 users, including things like the, uh, you know, Q-latch design to make things even simpler, right? But, um... Yeah, I think until we see more really demand from the community really genuinely asking for U.2, U.3, I don't think you're going to be seeing it on motherboards, okay? Um, do you know when new AMD boards are coming? 
why would there be any new AMD boards? There's uh, the chipsets already out, right? And uh, keep in mind the kind of the refresh right now is aligning with Intel's next gen refresh. Um, all the AM5 motherboards are active and they are class leading in terms of their core specifications. So there's not really any reasons right now to make any active refresh. But as always, if we make any refresh, um, we will be announcing it here on the PCDIY stream as well as in our PCDIY group. So if you're not following us there, make sure to go ahead and follow us there and we will keep you in the loop on the latest and greatest, okay? Yeah, um, well, that's what it was designed for. U.2 was great for small devices because that's what it was designed for, right? <laughs> M.2 was designed for thin clients, right? It was designed for laptops. And it just happened to be that as the specification was implementing PCI Express, it also saw kind of this translation to see a lot of community convention of people going, wow, these are really fast drives. It's so much faster than SATA. And it kind of became a pathway where people going, hey, this makes sense to put on a motherboard because we see these great things that laptops have and we don't have it and we want it. Um, but now we've kind of maybe gone too much in that direction where we pushed out U.2 at the expense of prioritizing M.2. But again, uh, it's still like great technology in terms of overall giving you a fast, robust storage solution. You know, there's no cables and you can still have a great experience. But when you fundamentally talk about the desktop, the desktop doesn't have space constraints. It doesn't have thermal constraints. It doesn't have power constraints. So ideally, it would be better suited to have a storage specification that I think can leverage that. Right. But. You know, a lot of people are happy with it. So, of course, we're going to continue to spec boards accordingly in that respect, right? All right. Um, Kefi, 75 games, has just picked up an Asus Tough Gaming uh, GeForce RTX 4070 Ti, and it's a beast, man. That's a great graphics card. Cool, quiet, fast. Make sure to check out GPU Tweak 3. That's our graphics card utility. So if maybe you want to do some tweaking and tuning, maybe do some, uh, you know, VF curve tuning, or maybe you want to be able to do some fan curve term. Uh, fan curve tuning or maybe you want to do some quick kind of performance logging uh yeah we've got gpu tweak three man but thanks for being tough gaming very cool uh remember sat express yes i do but i think that's a whole nother ball of wax right is that a power supply on the bottom i don't know what you're asking about there power supply on this small on this setup right here is actually in the back it's not even visible right here this right here is just a little cool it's actually a pci uh graphics card um support so this is actually our Herculex, but it doesn't need a support because this is such a basic graphics card. Uh, it's a 40, this is a 4060 or 4070. Um, but yeah, the power supply is actually back here. All right, um, that wraps up our stream, guys. So um, I know I said probably this week I was going to have the PC Dadwai Builder Spotlight, but I'm still finalizing just getting all those things sorted. So next week we will have our PC Dadwai Builders Spotlight back into play. So we'll be covering, of course, your guys' builds uh, from the community, whether they're uh, mini ITX, whether they're ATX, water cooled or air cooled, whatever they might be. We'd love to be able to show them off. So if you guys want to make sure to submit your builds to be featured on the stream, make sure to join our PC DIY group and submit your builds to be featured on the stream. Again, it doesn't have to be new. It could just maybe, maybe never been featured and you just want to be able to see it, get some love or maybe get my feedback on what I think about what you did with your build. I'd love to feature it here on the stream. So again, if you want to be part of the ASUS PC DIY Builders Spotlight, make sure to go ahead and do that. We'll also hopefully be uh, launching the not too distant future, the actual OC Spotlight. So we'll be highlighting some cool overclocks uh, be maybe talking a little bit about overclocking specific to those overclocks, maybe giving some insight specific to kind of performance tuning constraints, what that person maybe had to kind of account for when they were overclocking to hit those specific targets. So um, I think that'll be a cool little thing. So we'll have the PC Dower Web Builder Spotlight and we'll then also have the OC Spotlight. All right. Um, so that covers that, guys. All right, guys. Take care. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And if you're in my neck of the woods, uh, like I'm in right now, stay cool because it's a little bit warm right now. But with that, guys, take care. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Bye bye.